All right, so I'm going to try something new. Uh, this is, I think it's going to be episode 70, uh, 76 should be Growing Pain. 77 should be my chat with Pancake Analytics. So this should be 78. I am recording this. This is going to be uh, something that I try going forward, maybe. We'll see. But I am simulcasting, not simulcasting. I am recording video with the audio, so I am going to try to optimize for audio, meaning I'm not going to be showing cards, but I am going to be recording this uh, video so I can upload it onto YouTube so that it can be enjoyed by YouTube audience, which also includes people who just can't get podcasts in uh, internationally, such as you know my home country or my uh my motherland in south korea um i don't know if north korea has podcasts so anyway <clears throat> i wanted to make this podcast video uh audio whatever it's um, I'm, I'm gonna be calling it but i don't know if this one's gonna be good um i rarely wonder or think if any of my content podcasts or otherwise is gonna be good i am mainly doing this for my own edification and if people like it great if they don't um i guess you guys will let me know so what i wanted to talk about is getting into breaks because i have not that i'm making like a ton of money on ebay but with some extra cash flow from ebay sales i have decided to try to support breakers and getting into breaks um, particularly those who have been on this podcast. So friends of the podcasts, um, I have gotten into a Mrs. Squirts break, uh, and I can talk about that a little bit, but tonight or today, earlier today, and I'm recording this April 16th, it's a, it was a pre-release rip day because tops 2024 tops Chrome black is being released on April 17th. And I got into a, I saw, I saw something on Instagram. It was a <clears throat> post or a story post from Valor Sports Cards, friend of the podcast. And he said that he was going to be ripping 30 cases of 2024 Topps Chrome Black. And I thought, wow, that's, that's quite a number. Um, I, I remember Filth Bomb Breaks talking about their 100 case break. And I know that Valor is a one-man operation, really. And, you know, he doesn't have, like, packers and shippers and multiple breakers and a warehouse. And as a, as a friend of the podcast, I, I wanted to support him. So I, I checked it out. Uh, it was my first ever Fanatics Live uh, venture into it. And, you know, I used his code and all that stuff. Maybe I could shout that out. It was Valor20. For twenty dollars off my first purchase on Fanatics Live, so I go into the shop and he is, uh, or I go I go into a stream, <clears throat> and he's got it's like a pick your player PYP. Um, you know I've seen PYTs, pick your team and random and all that. Uh, you know people do auctions, people do fixed price. So he did PYP, fixed price with deals to be given to whoever maybe wanted to make some deals. So there are spots going as high as, I forget the exact number, but I mean, we're, we're talking like several thousand dollars for one player spot in a 30 case break and of, of Topps Chrome Black 2024. And there are player spots going for about, I think the, the lowest ones were, unless they were going for like a dollar or given away. Uh, to entice people, like $69, $79, something like that. And I thought, okay, well, if you average that out, 30 cases, it's like $2 per case for a player. You know, maybe it's it's worth it. Um, Tops Chrome Black, I don't know the exact configuration of how many boxes per case. I think, it. well, if he said 360 autos, and there's 30. I guess it's 12 hobby boxes per case with one auto, encased auto per box. So that would come out to 360 autos. Okay, so that's what he did. And I went in there, and I know that there's so much 
uh, again, I'm doing this without any notes, so it, this may be a lot of stream of consciousness, and apologies for that. But I just kind of wanted to give my real time, not real, real time, because I'm recording this like maybe six hours after it finished. But the thoughts that I had were, I want to support a friend of the podcast. I don't want to lose my shirt. I am not going to be spending several thousand dollars on any player spot. Um, but I also don't want to buy like these like $70 spots. So I know that people get into breaks as gambling. And it's like this way of, you know, putting in a lottery ticket and getting something big and then redeeming it and selling it and getting into more spots. I, instead of getting into like a prospects valuation and trying to make deals, <laughs> I don't know why I want. So for the people watching video, I, you know, you can see I'm wearing this Orioles hat. It's a Baltimore Oriole. It's a top slids Mitchell Ness thing. And I saw Eddie Murray and he was priced at, and forgive me, Valor, if I get it wrong, but I thought it was something around like $600 which out of, again, 30 cases, you're thinking, wow, okay, well, $20 per case, um, maybe it makes sense. Of course, veteran autos don't go for much. You know, I am buying, you know, a, a retired player. Um, let me check. He must be in the Hall of Fame, right? But here, here's the thing about Eddie Murray to me, okay? <laughs> now I have to wonder if I'm going to even publish this. Uh Eddie Murray, I know that he was a Met and he was a switch hitter. Those are the two things I know about him. Uh, it says here, a very quick Google search on the fly. Uh, so this was an Orioles spot. You know, there was Adley Rushman or Gunnar Henderson and Jim Palmer. That auto hit so many times. But this Eddie Murray was on sale from 600 something to like 300. So I don't know. I just thought I got some eBay money. Uh, Yes, it would take me, you know, more than a week's worth of sales to, you know, net profit 300, but I decided to get into it. And so this says Eddie Clarence Murray, nicknamed Steady Eddie, is an American former MLB first baseman, DH, and coach. Spending most of his MLB career with the Baltimore Orioles, he ranks fourth in team history in both games played and hits. He was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2003. So, Yes, mostly known to be a Oriole, I guess. Although I'm looking at his... Oh, yeah, he was an Oriole for a long time in the beginning of his career. Came back later in 96, it seems like. And he ended his career with the Dodgers. So I don't remember the Dodgers years. I don't remember the Angels years, the Guardian, Guardian slash Indians years. Uh, but I remember him as a Met in 92 and 93. So... This wasn't even going to the casino. This was, in a way, I mean, how do I even put it? Like, it's like going to the gift shop of the casino to scratch some small nostalgic itch. Baseball wasn't a huge sport as a kid, but, you know, I grew up in Queens. So I remember the Mets and I remembered Eddie Murray. Um, I didn't see Howard Johnson as an auto. <laughs> but for some reason, I latched on to Eddie Murray. I spent uh, $300. I did end up buying like two. They're called like serial spots. So it's a serial number spot. I thought it was a random. I could have asked uh, what it was, but I think a lot of us, if you're in a new space and you want to not appear to be a new person, you just kind of go with the flow. Um, but I ended up buying maybe a couple of serial number spots um, for the Nationals. Uh, what was it like for like Vlad Guerrero Sr. and uh cj abrams and blake something ferd rutherford see i'm gonna google this now blake nationals oh it is blake rutherford okay so oh okay the yankees selected him in the first round of the 2016 mlb draft then he made his mlb debut in 2023 with the nationals man seven years all right getting sidetracked here already so um, I have maybe about $400 uh, plus into this break. And, um, you know, what was really interesting is he, uh, being Valor, started breaking the boxes and cases before the break filled. I mean, he even talked about this in his podcast, Parents, where, uh, where the particular break where he 
was the lucky breaker who opened up that, you know, who, who was able to pull the Tom Brady one of one super factor. He didn't have the break fully filled. He ended up eating some of the spots and he did that in this one as well. But along the way, he was showing people the autos and he said, if you want these autos, you can actually get them. And I, I was fascinated because I did not think that you could sell spots as the break was going along. But, you know, one case in, two cases in, five cases in, I mean, even up to like something like 20 or 25 cases into a 30 case break, he was making deals with people. And I, I just found it really hard to not buy more. Uh, I definitely wanted to buy more, but I was being really disciplined. And I also in the back of my mind, I was like, where is this Eddie Murray card? Why has Eddie Murray not come out of this product? So I didn't watch the whole break. I was in and out. I was just kind of like, you know, but, you know, here and there I would ask, has Eddie Murray been hit? You know, the answer was no. And so I'm thinking in my head, like, why did I spend this amount of money? I mean, I know ultimately it was to support like a friend of the podcast and, you know, a, a hobby friend. But I was like, why did I spend money on this Eddie Murray spot? <laughs> it just seems so ridiculous because even if I hit an auto of his, that thing's probably going to sell for like if I if I kept it, you know, a different story. But like, you know, you could buy an Eddie Murray uh, veteran auto from 2024 Top Score in Black. I don't know. The market hasn't been set yet because the product just came out. But I'm guessing for like 30, 40, 50 dollars at most. I mean, if it's like really super low numbered, maybe like in the hundreds. So it didn't really make sense. I, I guess you would have to hit multiple autos, which, you know, at, at the end of the day, I didn't even then. I did not end up even getting one single hit or auto at all from this case break. But it was so fascinating to watch because this was indeed the case break where, or the 30 case break where Valor hit another one of one. He hit arguably the biggest hit or chase of the entire product, which was a one of one super factor of Jason Dominguez. And for me to watch that happen live and watch him pull it, but also be kind of like, uh, I don't know, maybe I'll have to have him on, but like despondent or or like annoyed that the spot wasn't purchased by a buyer, he ended up getting to own it. And not only that card, which is like a several thousand dollar card, but he ended up getting multiple Jason Dominguez, like low numbered, like, you know, out of 25 and 50 and 150. And like, he just kept hitting Jason Dominguez's over and over and over again to the point where he, he, I think near the end of the break uh, for a couple of people who skunked like big time, not Eddie Murray, $400 spots. I'm talking, um, I forget the exact names cause I don't have notes in front of me, but you know, there, there was a, uh, maybe like Ellie Dela Cruz spot for a couple of, thousand dollars and they got skunked or you know other other big prominent uh maybe i don't, I don't think we saw a single show Otani, and so he ended up just giving his jason dominguez autos not the super factor but uh you know some of the nice low numbered autos to his buyers his loyal buyers who spent several thousand dollars and got nothing so i you know i commend him uh especially I mean, even if you are a breaking company with, you know, multiple breakers and a, you know, front end of the house uh, and a back end of the house with packing and shipping, 30 cases is no joke. And for him to just do this all by himself in one day uh, and, you know, with days prior to that with pre-fill and then I know he's going to probably take a whole day with packing and shipping, um, I will admit. I mean, and this is this sounds absolutely crazy to even say it out loud, but in the back of my mind, I was like, I want to help him so much. I want to drive up to New York and help him pack and ship because I love that part of breaking. I don't even know. Uh, you know, one thing I want to say was, you know, there's a whatnot competitor who wants me to break or sell singles or do repacks, uh, mystery packs with them. And, you know, it's been on my mind a lot recently. And I don't, I ultimately don't think I'm going to do it, but there's a part of me that wants to just 
you know, just to experience it again and have fun and just kind of like just break. And the other big, larger part of me is like, just do the eBay sales. You like it. It's steady. It's, it's, you don't have to be on camera. Um, and you can just set your own pace. And so that all said, I really, <laughs> there's something about packing and shipping and sorting uh, after a break uh, that it's just like, it's like doing an errand or a chore. It's like, or, you know, I would just put on a podcast and I would just, you know, sort by teams and I would just get the sorting tray and just, just plop down and just start just doing chores. It's like doing laundry, doing dishes. And for some reason, there's a, a small completest part of me. I don't know if it's OCD, but it's just, it's just fun to do. So of course I did not end up going driving. I really, I was, you know, I told Valor, I was like, listen, if you were any closer or if I didn't have a family, but you know, the thing is I'm, I'm in DC, he's in New York. That's a five hour drive, uh, four and a half without any traffic, I guess. But also like I have a young family. So, you know, I did not make the drive. But watching him rip all that product and it, just imagining the absolute logistical nightmare and this part of me that just wanted to help him, it, it just, it, it was, it was pretty, it was, it was very enticing, uh, but it would have been incredibly irresponsible. Very early on in this podcast, I mentioned how there is this concept about you know, if the car comes around, do you get into it, right? You know, your friend, you're a teenager, you're at home, your friends come by in, in one of their cars and they say, hey, get in the car. Let's go. Uh, it's going to be fun. They don't tell you, you know, you ask, well, what's it going to be? You know, where are we going? It's like, don't worry about it. Just get in the car and go. So at that point, do you get in the car and do you go? So that was like one of my very earliest podcast episodes just talking about that concept of like the immediacy the fomo and i guess what i'm realizing is as a teenager you do go and then as a 20 year old you uh a person in their 20s you can go and then in your 30s you're like wait a minute um you know who <laughs> you know is there is there going to be adequate parking? Am I going to come back home in time? Am I going to, you know, and then in your forties, you're like, no, I have a family. I can't do that. And so I think as you get older, you don't get into the car literally and figuratively. I think maybe that's the main reason why I wanted to make this podcast episode is just that concept of maybe as you get older, you are supposed to have less FOMO. But then again, this entire hobby is surrounded by the premise of either nostalgia or th trying to fill holes in our childhoods with these pieces of cardboard. And also for the people who are, you know, doing ultra modern collecting, it's, there's no nostalgia with that, but there is a piece of, I don't know, trying to transact, trying to wheel and deal, flip, you know, grade and flip, pull that lever like a casino that cage lawyer has talked about that I've, you know, that I glommed onto and made a couple of podcast episodes about. So I think that ultimately you do, you do it for whatever reasons it is. Um, and you can justify it in any, however, you know, way you want, but ultimately I don't even know where I'm going with all of this. I just know that it was a lot of fun to watch. Uh, it might have been more fun if I had gotten a hit. <laughs> it might have been fun if Eddie Murray's name came up just as much as Jim Palmer's or instead of Jim Palmer's that Eddie Murray's came up. You know, this idea of like, I don't know, um, hindsight is so funny, right? It's like, of course I should have gotten the Jim Palmer auto spot instead of Eddie Murray's. Like... I interviewed Jim Palmer at the uh, Chantilly show uh, in October of 2023. And, you know, he's, he's, um, you know, he's a broadcaster and he's, 
he's just you know this this the dude who is in the whatever like those ads you know it's definitely before my time but like you know he's he was like really in the you know cultural zeitgeist uh in america with with um his persona but i didn't i didn't <laughs> i ended up going with the switch hitting former met but mostly an oriole um hall of fame inductee in, tw- in 2003 eddie murray and i didn't buy into the break to try to gamble to try to pull the lever and get a eddie murray one of one that that i could probably arguably buy for less than 300 dollars, and to pull the lever again and again and again um i was there to just support a friend you know uh was more i probably spent more doing that with that amount of money than going to a bar with a friend and running up a tab uh, or a really nice dinner with a friend but it really did give me the kind of like a crap you know it was like again like we talk about or you know the rated rabbi and i in the past have talked about how anytime you make a mistake quote unquote mistake in the hobby it's it's like tuition you pay tuition and I think that with breaking and getting into breaks, it's it's something that I'll, I think I'll, so long as it's there, I think I'll always be curious and try to get into it a little bit more. And just because it is a very prominent part of the current state of the hobby. Um, you know, when you go to a casino, I feel like nowadays you, see, I, and I don't go to casinos much, uh, at least in my you know, thirties and and forties. But um, my understanding is that a lot of the casino dealers, they are being, uh, the human dealers are being replaced by robots uh, or the, the video machine games, or like, you know, they'll have a screen with, uh, you know, a person on it and they'll be talking to you, but they're not sentient, if that's even uh, the way to put it but it's it's basically replacing the human element with with you know technology and part of me does wonder if breaking will go that route in the future i mean it sounds so weird to think okay robots are going to be the breakers right it's just how would they handle the cards is you you might as well get like a baby breaker which i've joked about in the past uh, cause they would be mishandling the cards, but of course there's also the, the non fungible tokens part, the NFTs, the digitals, the, the Panini digital and the, you know, whatever. And there's the element of surprise when it comes to those type of packs too. Um, that gets me to think about the eBay vaulting and how basically, uh, some of the comments that I've, uh, that have come my way uh, with the concern about this whole news about eBay and golden and PSA collectors just, you know, getting into this trade night, late night trade with assets and golden, I'm sorry, is basically that what they want to do, what these companies want to do, I guess you can include fanatics in it is to take away the actual, physical representation, uh, you know, holding the cards and getting to have them in your collection and in your house and replacing that with, you give them the money, they, they rip it for you. Someone, someone who is not in your house breaks the cards, they send it to grading, and then you can grade, then vault, sell it in the vault, and then it'll, go to someone else's vault or they can have it shipped back to them. And of course you can get it shipped back to you after grading too. But basically it seems like there's a lot of uh, automation that wants to be done here. uh, Perhaps in the future, maybe not even in the far future, maybe in the near future. So who knows what the state of breaking and grading and vaulting and all that looks like, but, what we do have is today. It's the now. It's funny, as I record this, we've gone into April 17th. It's past midnight. And 
I'm just rambling at this point, I guess. But this was this this episode. I don't know how it was to hear, but it was fun to just talk out loud, complete stream of consciousness, no notes. Recording this, I'll put up maybe the video for YouTube. At this point, I don't even know. But I don't know. I hope whatever I've said in the last 25-ish minutes that maybe something in there made sense because um, otherwise this was a complete waste of time. (laughs) So anyway, I think I'll just end there. Um, Again, this will, it's funny. I record this on April 16th slash 17th. I may accelerate the publishing of the, what I'm going to call the growing pains episode, episode 76, and then pancake analytics. Um, I'm also behind on my uh, promo reels. Uh, I have not done them yet for break comp uh, Nick, and I haven't done it for a cage lawyer. And I I feel so behind with so much content because I have so much f- fun to share and to just put out there into the world. And so, I don't know. Sometimes I feel a little bit overwhelmed, I guess, with all of that. But, you know, I, I said it recently to someone, it's, it's a first world problem. And it's a problem that I get to have um, because I do have so many ideas. Who knows how many of them are good or funny or actually going to be executed. But... Um, I get to have those problems, and it is ultimately really fun to make content. And I I may have said this in the past episode, but creating the content is is a hobby for me. It's part of the hobby. It is one of my hobbies. So I guess I include podcasting with that, too. Like, this is a hobby. I don't know. So... Anyway, thank you so much for listening. I don't have a good outro still. I'll figure that out. Uh, If you would like to check me out on YouTube, please do so. It's Denny underscore cards. Instagram, likely you already know what's up there. Um, Yeah, today was fun. Today was fun. Break 30 cases of 2024 Topps Chrome Black, and I buy a eddie murray spot and get skunked in 30 cases 360 hobby boxes not even a large checklist and yet no eddie murray (laughs) oh man gotta love this hobby all right till next time